you're totally entitled to have that yeah. opinion. It's just you're probably not going to be as beloved. This week on Backward Compatible, Richard Worth joins Jim and Chris to discuss convergence culture and the role of the audience in game design. Plus, Richard shares his thoughts on recent open world games and developers with good and bad community relations. The BackwardCompatible.com podcast starts right now. Hello, Backward Compatible listeners. Welcome to episode number 104 of the Backward-Compatible.com podcast. Games and new media with a splash of academia. As always, I'm Chris and I'm joined today by Jim. Hey, everybody. And unfortunately, Doc's unable to join us today for family reasons, but we have a very special returning guest. It is Richard. I'm kind of special, I guess. <laughs> you're, you're one of the co-founders of the Backward Compatible podcast, so. That's yeah. a little special. I, I'd, say, I'd say that. I'd yeah. say that counts. Welcome back, Richard. Hey, thanks. Yeah, so uh, Richard's in town for a few days, and uh, we're going to be talking today a little bit about the uh, stuff that you've been studying over there in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. Uh, Do you want to tell us briefly about that before we get going? Yeah, sure. So I'm really interested right now in looking at the relationship between developers and their audiences. So, you know, we've seen this growing trend of involving players' data and players' choices in the development process, sort of a, a growing connection between companies and their audiences via Twitch and word of mouth advertising or simply, you know, listening to community feedback in the development process. So just sort of researching the way in which that finds its way into the design process and the different methods of listening to players using their labor and, you know, generated content and things like that. Excellent. Yeah. What do, what do players really know anyway? Nothing. <laughs> uh, but first, we have some opening segments for you, including the button mosh. For the button mosh, where the crew jumps in on the video games they've been rocking lately. So I've, by pure stroke of fate, been playing every open world game out there. Uh, I, I think I've picked up Mass Effect Andromeda four separate times and have yet to hit the halfway mark. Um, on much better news, though, I've been playing Horizon Zero Dawn and have become fully addicted to that. I expect when I get back home to Pennsylvania, I'll blast through another 100 hours in a week. <laughs> Let me ask you something about that game, because I haven't played it yet, but I'm mm-hmm. a little curious. Um, from what I've seen, you're in an, an open-world environment. You've got a you know sky and mountain kind of set up. Yeah. You would think you'd need at least one dawn during your play experience. Is that not true? You know, honestly, I don't know if I've ever seen a day-night cycle yet. Oh, okay. Never mind then. Zero dawn. Got Zero it. Zero dawn. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I that don't. Explains everything. I'm actually going to keep an eye out on that now. I know that the next place that I'm going to is apparently a famous sunlight city or something. So I don't know. Maybe that maybe that's where the dawn is. Perfect. They're keeping it for themselves. <laughs> um, and then while I've been here in Dallas, um, I've been mooching off a friend's uh, Switch and got to play a little Breath of the Wild for the first time. And <gasps> that game is so incredible. That game by itself has convinced me to buy a Switch. So <laughs> it's. Oh, uh, it's amazing. I know I was I was actually watching you um, play it some, trying not to spoil anything, <laughs> <laughs> but just, just trying to give you a few tips because what I, what I love about that game is just how experimental that you're encouraged Absolutely. to be. Absolutely, yeah. That's my favorite thing thus far about it is, you know, I start off as Link and I walk out of the Shrine of Resurrection or whatever it is at the very beginning of the game and I can go anywhere. I didn't continue the first little story thing for probably about 45 minutes to an hour i just wandered around killing stuff getting one shot by stuff i shouldn't be killing then subsequently killing it after dying five more times (laughs) and the game just lets me go at my own pace have you gotten off the uh the great plateau yet no oh so you think you think you're in an open world now oh Wait till you get off the Great Plateau. The Great Plateau is like the tutorial area. I made it to their, the this game's version of Kakariko Village. Oh, then you have gotten. Oh, have I? Plateau. Okay, okay. It's the first part where you get the the um the glider. Oh yes, okay. Yeah, that that's the like tutorial, but not really section where you have to get the. You the know, honestly, I gotta say, I mean, obviously, I've only played like you know ten hours of the game so far, but 
I kind of wish I didn't have the glider when I was faced by these huge sheer cliffs and whatnot. And I had to very cleverly climb my way up this, that, and the other and navigate the terrain. It felt a lot more daunting Mm. now with the glider a little less so because you know you can kind of save yourself if you fall off the mountain edge so it feels a little less precarious you kind of can but when you run out of um stamina it can still be pretty bad oh does it okay yeah you'll you'll see and there's a lot of places you have to climb okay yeah honestly the game has completely just overwhelmed me with how impressive it is thus far so i'm definitely gonna be picking it up yeah it's definitely a game of the year candidate for Mm -hmm. sure yeah i mean honestly i didn't believe it when i first heard the articles where people were calling it the best game of all time Mm -hmm. but it's definitely in contention i don't know if it could ever beat out the witcher 3 in my opinion but you know yeah, and those are honestly pretty different games. Of They're, course. But they are both open world games. But, you know, that's the the problem with saying that something is the the best game or game of the year or even, you know, in Hollywood terms, you know, like what does the best actor constitute? Because there's dramas, there's action flicks, there's, you know, there's different best actors for different things. We all know it's Vin Diesel. <laughs> of course, <laughs> every time. Have you seen Return of Xander Cage? <laughs> Who hasn't? <laughs> I, I, I haven't. Chris, uh, Chris, come I'll, just, on. I'll leave now. <laughs> but yeah, so it seems like there's this predominant feeling that every game now has to be an open world game. The, every single game that we talked about thus far, and honestly, the last few games that I've played when I haven't been too busy, um, beyond obviously like MMOs, have been open world games. Everything from Inquisition to Andromeda, Horizon, The Witcher, Zelda, everything is in this sort of open world or sandbox. I think. In part, it's because they're able to um, put a lot of content out mm-hmm. and kind of show, oh, look at this this, incre- this incredible experience that you can have in this new gaming world. And it's kind of become a trend um, because I think in part because games are kind of expensive if you really think about it. And mm-hmm. people have these really expensive gaming rigs to play games now, whether you're playing on your PC or you're playing on a console. And so people feel like they have to justify that experience. And I, I just don't think that we're, we've moved past back in the day where you could have um, a lot of shorter, smaller experience games that you can replay a lot. Like back on the NES, you might have something like um, Contra and Super Mario Bros and Tetris and Dr. Mario. And you had these, um, a lot of those games are, are actually pretty short. If you play all the way through them, you're just expected to die a lot in the process um instead now with the open world games it kind of gives them an excuse to have to boast about the, no- the number of co- the number of hours that you have or the number of um kilometers or miles that you can you could traverse i remember that was one of the big advertising points for skyrim when it first came out is like skyrim is the equivalent of you know five square miles in real life you know and that's what i was thinking too is that i remember back when you know we were in high school or whatever um the big thing was people boasting about the number of hours of content in a game. And I wonder if that's what has led to this, like you were saying, is just the concept that, well, now there's no debate that this is a 40 plus hour experience because technically you can just do whatever you want. It's like, well, I don't know if that really counts. You know, it's, (laughs) it's, you know, what, when does quantity versus quality come into play? You know? And part of that too is um, they're trying to sell the game. And so what's better as like, you're sort of your, um, for lack of a better term, your money shot, mm-hmm. as in the beautiful picture of you're in this open terrain, you've got the character, and you can see, like, like the good example is uh, Breath of the Wild. You've got Link on top of that cliff, and he's looking out, and he can see basically all of Hyrule from that perspective. He can see the castle. He can see, um, oh, geez, I can't believe I forgot the name. I'm going to call it the Volcano like a non-gamer death mountain thank you very much death mountain um (laughs) but yes you can see all you can see all of the the terrain out in the distance and it's a very impressive shot and so that when when players see that they go oh wow look at all these things that i can do and that's something that you that you can communicate with just one screenshot and so i think that's a big part of yeah visually there's no question you know so um andromeda is an example of a game where every time i've landed on a new planet I've been visually impressed. To, to clarify, before we go on, you're talking about um, the new Mass Effect and not the 1990s uh, television series starring Kevin Sorbo. Yeah, or the new Gorillas hit single. 
Right. Okay. Right. Yeah. Good. So definitely <laughs> Mass Effect. Um, Our audience gets confused sometimes. Wait, so sure, in, I understand. The Gorillas hit single wasn't like the new theme for Mass Effect Andromeda. No, unfortunately, I think that's a missed opportunity. Really, <laughs> it is <laughs> yeah. definitely. So yeah. So with Andromeda, you land on this new planet, and it's like wow. That is truly amazing. What a gorgeous vista. And, you know, I have a similar thought every time I play a game. In fact, I was just in Houston and I introduced a friend of mine to The Witcher 3. I was, you know, he's not much of a gamer, so he just tends to take my opinion on whatever I throw his way. And so he started The Witcher and his first reaction was, wow, this is what games have become since I last played like, you know, Oblivion or Skyrim or something like that. It's like, yeah, yeah, games are f-ing gorgeous now, aren't they? Can we curse on this show? Um, <laughs> we can bleep it we, out if we, we really need we, to. Yeah, uh, I think I think we actually do have a explicit tag, right? We do. Yeah. Oh, well, so, good. F- awesome. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so but it like I was saying about the quantity versus quality thing. When does that one gorgeous, you know, uh, panoramic shot not equate to? enjoyable time so in the witcher Mm -hmm. i logged easily 140 hours oh yeah but every hour of that was quality content Mm -hmm. with andromeda i have to keep rebooting the game like i just like well okay it's been a couple weeks let me try it again let me come back to it because in the witcher all of your side quests are these meaningful narrative experiences these characters these little vignettes they're all like pretty salient and impactful and not to say that Andromeda doesn't have. Have you guys all played Mass Effect Andromeda? Uh, maybe like two hours. Uh, not really, no. Okay, I was not well, interested in it. Not much of a spoiler, but yeah. <laughs> there's a side quest where you're on the first planet, basically, and there's a little side quest to hunt down these scanners. It's like five scanners, but every time you get there, you hear this technician's audio log, right? Mm -hmm. And the premise of Andromeda is you and this huge crew have been in cryostasis for 600 years while you've gone across the universe. And so everybody you know and love back home is dead, right? That's how time works. Um, And so this technician is getting audio logs from his like sick son back home and so as you boot up each of the signals you get a little bit more of this guy's logs that were like his motivation to provide this new home in this galaxy so those those little vignettes are honestly what i love about open world games the fact that you can have contained little narratives just interspersed throughout gameplay Mm -hmm. but that is so few and far between Mm -hmm. in andromeda whereas i would say in the witcher it's almost unilateral yeah, and I, and The Witcher, of course, had an advantage because it's coming from a series of novels. Of it's course. It's also the third in a series of games, although to be fair, Andromeda does have the background of the rest of the Mass Effect series. So they have, they've had their time to do world building and effectively um, create a living, breathing space, and apparently they kind of failed to do that. Well, because it's interesting you say that. They had all this time to build the Milky Way. It's like, okay, now that we've established what the Milky Way is all about, let's leave and go to a completely different galaxy. Yeah, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. So uh, maybe the fan base just came in expecting this rich lore and background, but this first game had to essentially establish it all over again. Because, yeah, there's a lot of really awkward um, introduction to new races and species and sort of political diatribe between these people. And Well, honestly, I mean, if I can be totally honest, um, I played maybe um, the first 30 minutes of The Witcher 2 and I watched a friend play a little bit of the first Witcher. I came into The Witcher 3 with very little background knowledge, and I felt that that was a perfectly acceptable way to experience the game. Yeah, I 100% agree. I basically had my buddy watch uh, recaps on YouTube and then play The Witcher 3. So, But, you know, there's something to also be said about just... Um, well, you know, those vignettes, they're standalone. Uh, gameplay experience doesn't really require all that much context, the basic, you know, Ludo versus narrative argument, you know. Think about Breath of the Wild, right? The characters there really don't say a lot. The, we talked about this in, like, episode two or three or something, and mm-hmm. then Zelda and Link is all about that mythos, right? Uh, I think Jim disagreed pretty heartily with some of the things I was saying. Yes. <laughs> but It actually, it's come up before, too, actually, somewhat recently when we talked about the game about how... Um, I disagree with people that say that Link is a blank slate. I mm-hmm. do believe that he is a character, 
just because he doesn't speak doesn't mean that he doesn't have a, a personality. I definitely agree with you more in this game in Breath of the Wild because yeah. he very does clearly have a past and things mm-hmm. like that. Um, and you see more of his his story with uh, Zelda too as you oh, continue you? in the game. Okay, through flashback sequences, of course. But so it's like you know, with Breath of the Wild, at least the little bit that I've played, you know, you don't need substantial dialogue really. You know, you don't need involved branching narrative. It's really just about the core gameplay. It's fun as hell to want the world and you know randomly come across this camp of seven enemies and sort of strategically think about how you're going to do this and the fact that your weapons break and you know just this core gameplay is very satisfying when combined with an exploratory sort of open world um and so you have to wonder what is the right formula for an open world and how do developers arrive at what that formula is for the context of their game Mm -hmm. And, and i agree with you there are a lot of them um a lot of open world games being produced for these reasons that we've talked about, but I do hope that developers will continue to explore other um, game genres and game concepts and not feel that just because they're having, for example, um, I want to make a big action game in this environment. Okay. You could make a 3d action game without it being open world. So I want people to kind of still feel that way. I, I played a game recently which um, I won't go into here, but I've, I've gushed about it a lot on the podcast, um, Near Automata. Mm-hmm. I played um, that. It's incredible. For me, it's my game of the year. Um, did you play all through all the endings? No, I've only played through, I think, about 20, 30 hours. You did not play the game then? Yeah. Oh, really? Yes. It drastically changes? Drastically. And the 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 ending to me, and, and I talked about it on the on a previous show, was in my opinion, one of the most impactful game endings ever that I've ever experienced. Wow. But I mean the true ending. You have to go through, you have to basically play the game, replay it again, and then there's like, the third path is actually a continuation of the first story that you played through. Completely new continuation. And they basically turn the entire game on its head. And the ending to that, and then followed by unlocking the true ending, the way that it's presented, to me, I felt was one of the most... um, not just impactful, but also artistic and experimental endings in a video game that I've that I have played in all of my years of gaming. But the reason I bring it up here is that some have argued that um, Nier is also an open world game, which it kind of is, but not really. If you if you see what I'm saying, it's mm-hmm. it's still very much a linear experience. Is That's it, actually so. I was going to mention the Dragon Age series, right? Right. If you just chart from Dragon Age Origins to two to Inquisition, you can see different instantiations of the you know sandbox or open world style concept. Whereas Dragon Age Origins, you, I mean, it, it had like the open world feel. It had different zones and instances in, in a sort of established world setting, but it was very much a contained experience. You know, then in two you pretty much just stick to the same town the whole game, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then in Inquisition, they fully just knock down the walls and give you the whole open world to explore. And by doing that, objectively, you can sort of see how the Dragon Age IP, narrative characters, whatever, how it thrives in each different type of environment, right? And I would say, undisputably, Dragon Age Origins was the best. I'd agree. I was about to say the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. And I would say that while 2 definitely suffered from myriad other issues, it was too contained for Dragon Age. Mm -hmm. And Inquisition was simply too large, or at least with not enough merit to the open world concept. um, Before we leave the concept of of open world games, I I do want to to raise that point, too, that you're kind of touching on. some of these games, the open world games, they they can be engrossing for a while, but if they don't, if they're the main thrust of the game doesn't grab you, you can play a lot of hours, but never really get anywhere and then give up. Yep, absolutely. And that was always my experience with Skyrim. I've never beaten Skyrim. I've put a lot of hours into it. I've explored, I've explored it, but one, there's a lot of areas in the world that are simply not interesting, and two, the main quest is simply boring i think we also talked about this you know a hundred episodes ago as well and the same reason that i agree with you is that skyrim is great for the same reasons that it alienates some people so it's great in the sense that you know just do whatever this is a playground you know go have fun but i don't want to be the head of the thieves guild and of the Mm -hmm. mages college Mm -hmm. and of the brawlers and and it's just not impactful. I need some sort of, even if my character is an avatar, right? Or a blank slate or whatever, I need some sort of 
ambition, path of progression that isn't just a hundred percent completion, you know? Right. Mm-hmm. right. I agree. Um, well, I mean, we'll see. Cause I think, I think we, with the success of breath of the wild, to me, I feel like it sort of established the template for, for which other open world games will be judged from here onward when it comes to just the way that it incorporates exploration, um, and experimentation. And I feel that we're going to see that carried through in new new open world games that that are being developed. Or at least now we have a fuller suite of types of open world games, right? You know, because right. we mentioned just a little bit ago that The Witcher and Breath of the Wild are drastically different games. Sure. And I would say that Andromeda is also different from those two and so and on and so forth. We haven't even touched on Grand Theft Auto slash Red Dead Redemption. Rockstar is, I think they're brilliant. I think they've perfected one sort of open world game. Mm-hmm. But there is that other sort of open world game that I feel that... Um, Breath of the Wild has has become, and it's its own thing. And we're going to see a lot of uh, Breath in the Breath of the Wild clones, just like we've seen tons of GTA clones. Mm-hmm. Yep, absolutely, I agree. And I think um, that ties really well into our next segment. Actually, this is Back Talk, where someone shares new thoughts on a previous discussion. All right, so we're changing up our back talk segment just a little bit. Uh, before it was exclusively something for when one of us missed an episode, we can kind of come back and talk about something that we missed. Uh, but we found that we weren't using that that often, and I found myself listening back to an old podcast, say, well, I'm editing or just like re-listening to something old, and finding a point that might have gone undisputed or something new that I've thought of uh, in the time since that I'd like to sort of bring to the table. And so uh, I was listening back a little bit, speaking of open world games, to our discussion on scale in game worlds. One of the things we ended up concluding was that a one-to-one scale has a lot of issues and it's usually not really worth making it one-to-one. And you can go back and listen to that episode for a while. We thought that. But I did realize there was a case in which I think one-to-one would actually be really neat. And that is in city simulation games, city builders. Um, For example, some games off a bigger scale than others. You can sort of tell that uh, you know, like your your metropolis that you're building is more sweeping, more grand, there are more buildings, more roads, that sort of thing. Um, but they always, to me, have felt really small, really microcosmic. Like downtown is only so many buildings and it's like right down the street from the suburb, you know. Um, and I think uh, SimCity 2013 especially had just really tiny areas in which you could work. And I think they might have expanded it. I'm not sure. Um, but it just didn't feel like a city. It just felt really, really tiny and really contained, especially given that like, you know, you'd have another town down the highway, but like, you know, you're kind of restricted to your little bubble. And so you just have like little bubbles of tiny cities and it doesn't really feel like, you know, real city building. And so what I'd love to see is a game that if it's not truly one-to-one, it really approaches a one-to-one scale. So you can get a sense for what it's like to have to say, manage a Dallas or a DFW Metroplex, for example. Um, in its full scale with all the roads and all the buildings and that sort of thing. I think that that'd be something really interesting to explore. And even um, the finance, if that was more of a one-to-one sort of thing as well. Yeah, you know, that's interesting that you bring that point up because that was one of my criticisms of um, Civ Six was the newest one, or Civ Five. Civ Six was the newest one. Six is the newest one, yeah. Okay, Six. Um, when I was playing that, you know, and I love the Civ series, you know, I've put in over, like over two, 300 hours on each Civ. Um, in this newest one, they changed it so that when you build little districts and buildings, um, certain buildings that they do require entire new tiles, right? So if you're going to build a commerce hub or something, it requires an adjacent tile somewhere. Mm-hmm. But then everything within that hub, you build trading posts or you know banks or whatever. They all are still contained within that hub. Mm-hmm. And that is... An improvement in some ways on previous games, you know, because it used to be that just you would have um, everything your one tile, right? Your one main city tile and you just buy all the stuff in there. Mm -hmm. This is an improvement, but more to what you say is like, I would like to see more of that. Mm -hmm. And I know that in the past I've had conversations with folks about the difference between um, graphical power, power and processing power Mm -hmm. in games. And we always go back to uh, Dwarf Fortress, Mm -hmm. you know, so Every time we see a new game released, it's typically possible because of a leap in GPU technology. But as any gamer will say, really, you only really need an i5 mm-hmm. to play most of these games. In fact, you could skate by with an i3 on a lot of these newer titles if you maybe reduce some settings here and there. Mm-hmm. No real game, to my knowledge, 
takes advantage of or requires like an i7 processor, right? So I think that one of those one-to-one city builders or, I mean, hell, a an uh, over-the-top RTS, imagine if you were doing an RTS with a full cityscape, mm-hmm. right? Um, you literally have to conquer the world. Or it's like, you know, your enemies <laughs> your enemies have conquered your residential district, mm-hmm. right? Or I'm thinking of like a, a flight simulator where it's like, you know, modern air-to-air combat we are literally miles away from the enemy. Mm-hmm. You launch a missile across like 50 miles or something like that. I'm not sure how much it actually is, but it's a very, you, you don't see them half the time. Right. <laughs> and so I wondering both from a creative standpoint, you know, when are we going to see something like that? Or will we see something like that? Is that too big of an undertaking for a studio? But also do we have the processing power to do something like that? Like obviously we can run it in simulations, yeah. but can we render that real time? Right. And mm-hmm. we actually did talk about that on, on that, on that show as well with the one, one and the, the limitations of, of processing is a big reason why we don't see that. Also this, the limitation of it's not as fun for a lot of genres. Of course, mm-hmm. like if you were actually in a GTA and it was one-to-one scale of a city, it would take you forever to get anywhere and it would just be boring. Right. But it's a little bit different with something like Sim. Mm-hmm. This is the Gaming Meta, news and commentary about the games industry and gamer culture. So earlier we were talking about the concept of every open world game is a little different, right? And I I thought about the concept of, well, how do developers determine what the specific formula for their open world game is? And obviously, the success of a game isn't just objectively attached to the final product, right? It's the audiences that determine if a game is, is a success or not. And so I've really been interested lately in, you know, how do developers find out what people want and how do people give feedback and then what does that relationship entail? And do they even care? Yeah, and do they even care? Yeah. And so there's this sort of, I, I, yeah, a meta discussion going on right now of developer responses to player communities or um, player responses to developer updates and things like that. And the biggest one that stands out to me that, you know, you see the meme all the time over in the World of Warcraft Twitch section is, um, you know, a player was at a BlizzCon event and was giving feedback to the developers on stage asking You know, have you heard our complaints or have you heard our desires? And are you going to do this? When are you going to do this? And the developer just grabs his microphone and says, well, you think you want that, but you don't. Essentially saying that 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 was a quote, essentially (laughs) saying that. Well, we know what's best for you. Well, and I would argue that there are some cases where someone proposes something and they don't think through all the implications. Of course, of course. Yeah. But this is so to give a little context to that statement, right? The player in question was asking about um so World of Warcraft is a 12, 13 year old game, right? And a large portion of the community was asking for what are called legacy servers. Basically you could Oh no, I, I I'm totally aware of this because it's something yeah. that I think I mean, I don't play I don't have the time to play WoW anymore, but If I did, I'd be on a legacy server. And yeah, this huge portion of the community just, they kind of wish that they could just for a day or two or maybe once in a while hop onto a server that takes them back, right? I know I've been playing the game since I was 12 or 13, so I would love to just go back and see what it would be like now with our skill as 2017 gamers to go try and progress through an old raid or something. Pre-cataclysm, before any of the expansions came out, um, where... You know, uh, dropping dropping Anixia was like a huge accomplishment. Yeah, essentially, is that kind of what you're? Sure. Yeah. Molten or, core. That's your. Or just that's the your fact ceiling. That, right. <laughs> or or just the fact that there were these game experiences that a lot of people never got to progress through. Right. So only twenty one guilds in the world killed the final boss in vanilla World of Warcraft before Burning Crusade came out. Oh, I did. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. Before Burning Crusade was released, Kel'Thuzad, the last boss, was only killed by twenty one guilds in the world. Um, and so there's just this general sentiment like, well, not only do I miss it from a nostalgia standpoint, but I just kind of want to experience that now at my current age, at my current skill level, whatever. Richard, you think you want to do that? 
But you don't. But you don't. (laughs) And so, exactly. So if there's such a large sentiment of the community, so much so that they gathered, I think it was 200,000 petition signatures. They got a previous head of Blizzard WoW development to like print them out Mm -hmm. and wheelbarrow them into the guy's office to be like, look, people want this. Hmm. So where where does that disconnect come from? And part of it, I think, is... One, I think that they might be concerned um, just how much that's going to translate to money. Sure. Um, that That's a big concern for them as well because they would have to maintain those servers. Um, they might also be worried that people will get too caught up in those and not buy into the new expansions. And there could be a and, plethora right. of reasons. And, but the thing is, it's the question really isn't about why aren't they doing it. It's why do they communicate that way? Why yeah. is there no why, dialogue? And why is it not? honest if that's those are the real concerns because i i was thinking of uh the similar issue with uh capcom and marvel versus capcom infinite the new game that was that was shown at e3 it's right. coming out um it's actually faced a lot of criticism and i think rightly so for things like the size of its roster um missing characters poor um, animations and uh, character models but uh one of the things that i thought was very insulting to the community um was the omission of um, X-Men characters, which have been a part of the the series since the beginning and are typically some of the most popular characters, not just in Marvel versus Capcom, but just in general superhero fandom. Absolutely. Uh, the X-Men, if people think of, you know, if you think of, uh, name some popular comic book characters, the first names that come to people's heads are going to be people like Wolverine, Magneto, Storm. These are characters that people immediately associate and think of so and they've had a huge arcade presence for and decades. they've had a huge arcade presence well um as you have probably heard uh there are no x-men in the new marvel versus capcom game. right and of course the reason for that behind the scenes we all know is because disney is having their little feud with fox they're both children and mm-hmm. disney feels that if they include x-men in this game it's going to be promoting fox and their film properties because they own the character rights just for the films. For yes. The films, yes. Yeah. And so, um, and therefore that's why we have more guardians of the galaxy characters. We have, for example, captain Marvel because she has a movie coming out. So they're using this as a, as a way to push this character, which is actually not that well known. And they, popular. of course they came out in a public statement and said exactly that, right? No, that's the problem. So the actual <laughs> public statement from, um, I believe his name is Pete, Ro- Pete Rosa. Um, I found various quotes, but he's from Capcom. And um, his quote says, when asked about X-Men, um, your modern Marvel fan, maybe they don't even remember the X-Men characters, but they know the Guardians characters, Black Panther. It's like, well, okay, they might be aware of the movie, those, those movie characters, but it's absurd to try to claim that, that modern Marvel fans don't know the X-Men. For starters, we literally just had... One of, in my opinion, one of the best superhero movies to date, Logan. Logan. Yeah, incredible film, very powerful. Mm-hmm. And it just came out a few months ago, and it stars quite possibly, uh, well, definitely the most popular X Men, but one of the most popular comic book characters, period. And, it, you know, they could have said anything like, we wanted to try diversifying the cast and we only mm-hmm. had this many hours dedicated to developing characters or we have this data that suggests that the X-Men characters are not popular in, in our <laughs> game. Right, obviously. Or they could have just been honest and said, Disney straight up told us, no, you cannot use the X-Men. You're going to have to use other characters. And here are the characters from a list that we will provide to you that you can use. And they're going to be characters from recent movies or upcoming films I understand the reason to do that, but it makes the game feel very corporate, yeah. and it's not listening to the players, because clearly the players want the characters that they're familiar with, the play style. And part of this, and I didn't find the exact quote, but um, in that same interview, he refers to characters as, quote, functions. And so they're not – so people don't really – it's the same sort of concept. They don't really want the characters. The characters are just functions. It can be anyone. It doesn't matter if you're playing as Rocket Raccoon or Wolverine. It's the same thing, it's right? All, it's all about the hitbox, Right? No, of course. We know as, as, as wow. players of fighting games, that's absurd. Even, even knowing that that statement is just corporate talk BS, that just blows my mind that somebody would say something like that. Especially when you already have – the community upset with you. Um, try not to get too derailed here, but there was a reveal for Dragon Ball Fighter Z at uh, E3 as well, which essentially just 
blew Marvel vs. Capcom away. Mm-hmm. It looked. I am excited for oh, that. Oh, and it looked unbelievable. And you compare it to what Marvel vs. Capcom looks like and the way that they're treating their community, and they should be a little bit concerned because yeah. there are a lot of players that are now seeing that game and they go, oh, well, maybe I'll just play this instead. And it makes you question so, what are the decisions that have a company do things like that that alienate their community or that or you know why would they say something like that but then also is there a is there an importance to having the faith of your community i would say of course yes but i i wonder if some of these you know we have this almost universal distaste for ea activision that's mm-hmm. like the the gamer sentiment towards those companies is just not great and and who are the companies that that we all we talk about and gamers seem to love it's it's companies like cd project red rockstar these are companies that listen to the fans um they they might take their time releasing products but when they do they're they're quality products and um I, admittedly G, um rockstar has taken a little bit of heat from um the shark cards and all of the, yeah. the the online stuff admittedly for gta online but but those are more gaffes than, those are gaffes yeah, yeah. And, so. they, and they and they're very open with um, but you know honestly the, the fact that we're so readily willing to say that's a gaff we would not do that for ea or activision right oh no so rockstar has built up this faith that allows us to brush things off and you have a studio like cd project red that you just mentioned with the witcher they released over a dozen free DLCs that were entirely new character outfits, entirely new quests. Some of those quests that were free DLCs were like hour long experiences. Yeah. And the expansion passes that they released that were 10 bucks, 15 bucks, something like that. They're anywhere. So Hearts of Stone was like 15 to 20 hours. Blood and Wine was 40 to 50 hours. Blood and, Blood and Wine was essentially a standalone game. It's incredible. You're in a completely new. They, they created a completely new region. And a completely new storyline and completely new, you know, smaller quest within that storyline. It's unbelievable. But in every time they do something like that, they communicate with the players and saying, you know, look, guys, we want you to enjoy our game. Here's we're going to release 14 free DLCs, one every week for the next 14 weeks. Just here you go. And then they listened to player feedback when players were really concerned that this was the last Geralt of Rivia game. CD Projekt Red directly addressed the players like, look, this is, you know, this character is great, but we can give you other adventures in the Witcher universe. And so because there's that open dialogue, they just recently had that scandal, right, where they one of their other their cyberpunk 2077 project. Yes. um, It got leaked to a certain group of people and those people we're essentially trying to blackmail CD Projekt Red uh, with threaten- threatening to release this information. And CD Projekt Red said to everybody, look, we're not going to capitulate to this. You know that you can trust what we say about this game. Don't trust what anybody else says. We will give you information when it's ready. And by and large, the fan response was, yeah, of course, we trust you. Mm-hmm. A lot of companies could not get that response. Yep, exactly. Um, and I think as we're as we're talking about um, that relationship between the developers and the player, I think that's a good uh, time to transition into our meaty topic. Yeah, sure. And now, this week's meaty topic of discussion. How are players or audience members involved in the development process, either directly or indirectly? And that's why there's that distinction between player, the individual contributing something like, you know, beta testing, bug reporting, user generated content. If, if you make mm-hmm. something for the game. Well, what about all of that? I mean, you've you've played World of Warcraft for a long time. Mm-hmm. So, of course, you're aware of, of all of the um, user user generated extra extra ui extra um you know macros and things like that that were added into world of warcraft by the by the community by players that were eventually adopted officially by blizzard into the game absolutely uh, because they they listen to the community yes absolutely so you have the concept of players contributing to the development team uh when blizzard wants to push a new patch through 
They have thousands of players going to the public test realms, testing things out, providing feedback, reporting bugs, giving creative feedback, like literal intellectual property. These players are coming up with it. It is their idea, and they are just gifting it to Blizzard. Um, The same thing with... Uh, like you mentioned, UI configurations and Mm add-ons. There is a monstrous community that creates add-on packs, immense amounts of data, all free. And this not only improves the game for a certain subset of Blizzard's player base, but like you said, Blizzard has then been able to just directly incorporate them into the game. Mm -hmm. And And that didn't cost them anything. No, and you mentioned, um, Scott, we were talking about Skyrim a little earlier, and one of the things that has kept that game alive is the modding community. Absolutely. So user-generated content. Uh, Skyrim and ev- any sort of uh, Elder Scrolls game comes with its famous Unreal, or not Unreal, uh, Elder Scrolls editor, right? You can create your own quest lines and players upload all sorts of new stuff from new texture packs to new cities and towns to new sub stories. I know that when I was originally interested in going to a different master's program, we have the guild hall here uh, in Dallas. It's like a vocational school. One of the things that they have you do in the program. And I think even as like an application material is to design an experience in a game editor Hmm. and then present that. And It's gotten to the point where that is so ubiquitous amongst these types of larger open world or just large scale games that players have essentially become producers of content. Yeah, and this is something that's been um, actually helped sell games and drive uh, drive games to become massive and culturally important properties like Doom, for example, I think is one of the biggest examples of this because you had uh, the doom editor Mm -hmm. and people were able to create their own levels and their own content it i think helped propel doom to be not just this and it was when it came out of course just the just the regular campaign was a great game but with the their uh id's embracement embracing the mod community it really it helped it stick around i think and then it became something that that was common for um in doom 2 it was later used in duke nukem and other fps's and uh, it just kind of became a staple for that uh, for the FPS genre for many years. And then honestly, it has shaped the industry. You know, I remember a while back we talked about Telltale Games. Um, for those who are unfamiliar, Telltale is a studio that creates these narrative experiences. They're basically storytelling games with a smidge of gameplay, but they release their games chopped up into episodes, and they develop the first episode and then sort of the backbone for the series. They release that first episode, and then they collect data. They see what players chose to do in their story. They read their forums. They watch YouTube Let's Players. They gather all of this feedback, and then they use it to create or shift or adjust the second episode. And uh, the CEO of Telltale at a DICE convention famously talked about how they watched these players react to these pivotal scenes in, you know, episode two of The Walking Dead, uh, their game. And it's like, wow, we didn't realize what an impact this moment was going to have on the community. Let's emphasize that in the next few episodes. And so they shifted the narrative of the game because they could see that the players wanted this. So would you think, because this is, this is really your topic of st- um, study, correct, mm-hmm. for your dissertation. So do you think that the rise of... Um, let's play and just youtube in general has allowed developers this a greater sense of connectivity with the player base i think it has allowed for the opportunity i think a lot of developers have been slow to pick up on that but more than just the presence of youtube and that impact i think it's the presence of youtube in general um to get a little abstract convergence culture it's the concept that as we move forward with technology, multiple individual forms of media are now converging such that we have um, – you used to have a television set and then you would have a, an arcade box and you would have an internet you know, and they did different things. And now they're all combining into a single functional tool. So YouTube is a video streaming service, content upload platform for creators, a community, right, with content feedback, with comments and discussion. It's essentially social media. It is now also integrated with Google, you know, and it's everything is connected. So you you take a look at something like Twitch. 
Twitch is essentially a microcosm of gamer culture, gamer community. You could transplant chat windows from Twitch into any gamer chat service, YouTube comments, Discord channels, things like that, and it's all translatable. So developers can use that as a feeding ground. So in in the research that that you've that you've already conducted, um do you think that develop? I know because we talked, we sort of ripped a few developers for not listening to the mm-hmm. gaming community, um, and then we talked about a few that do. But what do you think developers could do to listen more? And how do you how do you tell apart just essentially gamer bitching because there's a lot of that, sure, um, from legitimate criticism? Well, you see, that's actually sort of what I'm trying to get the, get at the heart of. So I don't really have a concrete answer for that, but I think that it's. It's sort of a mixture of the qualitative and quantitative sides, right? So you have companies like Valve, when they were developing Half-Life 2 Episode 2, they released to the public a lot of their design methods, and they used player analytics. They tracked every millisecond of data from players and used it to generate heat maps. So you could see an overhead view of a map and coloration as to where players died or where they ran out of ammo or things like that and so you had quantitative data to back up well this might be too hard or this might be lacking in difficulty or something like that did did they use this to influence their or i guess they still are to influence their design of episode three (laughs) there is no episode three i know (laughs) i thought it was confirmed that's the running joke i know it's confirmed all the time though i mean (laughs) Yeah, but that's But you're right. No, no. That's that's I mean that's really neat that they I didn't actually know about the uh, them using all of that information which um it's actually pretty cool. Back yeah, it's when still Valve available to develop games. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's still available on the you can literally just google like Half-Life 2 episode 2 heat map and it's hmm. it's amazing to look at the data. But then also qualitatively, right? You know, you have uh so I dished on Blizzard for uh that whole episode of uh at BlizzCon, but There is this new Blizzard philosophy that every single one of their games, they should have community representatives very forward facing, right? You should know their names. You should be able to see them. And so every single Blizzard game, except Diablo, because what is Diablo anymore, uh, has a face to it. Mm -hmm. You know, um, Jeff Kaplan from Overwatch, Mm -hmm. Ben Brode from Hearthstone, Ian Hazacostas. You know, you can name these people. And in fact, just... I think it was two days ago, Blizzard reached out to Reddit and had a a developer AMA about class design. And they basically all of the gamer communities that are subdivided into classes they play in the game self-organized. And they had their elected representatives essentially come forward with a compendium of feedback. We don't like this about our class. We don't like this. We do like this. Hit this harder. Here is our data, you know, and so come like uh, player bases will come forward with logs and simulations and qualitative statements. I don't like how this feels versus these logs show that my class underperforms compared to this class. And so this is a way that not only can you listen to the community in a more really rich and qualitative way, but you can have players dedicate hundreds of hours of labor for free. And on that subject, too, because there's there's also that element of on the developer side, when should they listen? Um, I know at my company, um, iStation, which is an educational gaming company or educational software, I should say, company, um, we do get a lot of feedback from the community that we hear through support. Um, there's a a famous YouTube video going around, at least famous in our company, um, of a kid that essentially is being forced by their parents to play iStation and mm. doesn't doesn't want to. So he's screaming, "Oh no, I don't want to do that!" Basically pitching a a, a little baby fit, um, and it's it's kind of become sort of a running joke, but. The sort of feedback that sometimes that we get from children are things that we simply can't change. Like if if a teacher, say, writes in and this has happened, um, submits letters or, or parts of letters or supposed quotes from from kids about what they don't like doing, um, there's things that we simply can't do because we have we have to hit certain core educational standards in order to actually pass – pass the mustard as a, as a educational product. There's a curriculum you have to follow. Right. And yeah. if we don't follow that, we literally can't get in schools. And while kids might want to do something else because it's more fun, um, 
it is an educational product. At the end of the day, it has to hit certain certain points. So we can listen on certain things, and we have tried to change, for example, avoiding um, lecture when we can and trying right. to get to the interactive. And that's been a big push since I've been there is trying to push the let's let them play, let's get them into the the interactive interactivity part. So we can try to lessen up on some of the the actual lecture aspects of it. But there's a lot that we simply can't do. So you kind of have to balance that. That what do the players like? What can what can we give to the players and still have a viable product? Yeah, I think you honestly just gave a really good answer to your own question. So you know you have these. Combat- combative elements, right? So for you, because you have to meet these curricula standards, and honestly, you're probably really interested in measuring the success of mm-hmm. people who use your product, the quantitative side can come in there, player tracking, data analytics, seeing, you know, based on these performance metrics and how long they stay on this page or how quickly they interact with these menu options, basic sort of human computer interaction research methods, you can then hone in on the design of your product. But then say that they want these things that you can't really change. You can sort of qualitatively suss out, well, we can't really change the material. They have to learn it. Mm-hmm. But we could do this thing that makes it more engaging or or maybe we divide it up into smaller segments or maybe we map it out differently, let them navigate through the lessons differently. And, and that's a way that you can take player feedback into account, even though you cannot really change the core of what's going on. Mm-hmm. And there's also that extra added element um, here, which I think you get a little bit in games in game spaces too, entertainment game spaces, where you might get feedback from like the students are our players to an extent, but really it's it's the teachers. Mm-hmm. So the students might have one opinion, but they're also children and they're looking at it from a different perspective than the teachers might be. So even when it comes to video games, um, you have a large um, age range of people that are playing. So you might get feedback from someone that say you know, eight years old about your game that maybe they have a valid complaint, but it might be something that, well, no, we actually, we shouldn't do that because it could negatively impact our game. Um, They may not be able to see that because they're looking at it from a more narrow perspective. And they may not necessarily, when they get this feedback, they may not necessarily know, is it coming from um, a player of their game for say 15 years for something like World of Warcraft, or is it coming from, you know, an eight-year-old that just picked it up the other day? Yeah, absolutely. Then that's a fair point. And I think that that is what resulted in the whole Blizzard debacle where they said, you know, you think you do, but you don't. It's like they have a different perspective. The issue becomes how do we bridge that gap in perspective? But then additionally, also, how do we turn community data, player data, how do we turn that into actual salient feedback, into change, into objectives and milestones, and how do we fit that into the development cycle and and things like that? And so you have these drastically different instances of, say, Telltale, where their development method, their actual distribution and economic system is based around that. So they do it very, very easily. Whereas another company, like say you're developing the next Last of Us, right? You're developing this product and then you ship that product. You you can't really make a salient change to the narrative via a patch, right? That, <laughs> no. I mean, look at what happened to Mass Effect 3, right? You know, um, you can't just change it on the fly. You have to face the ramifications. In which case, I suppose it has to be this sort of And that's sort of the data that I might be getting from this project when I start doing interviews and things like that. Maybe the company heads say, like, look, we we have a timetable and we simply don't have time to bring in dozens and dozens of focus groups to tell us their opinions about the ending. But then, you know, my question would be, what are you trying to do? Are you trying to create the most effective financial piece or are you trying to create the most effective narrative experience or gameplay experience? Mm -hmm. And so. The question I'm trying to get at through my research isn't what is the best method. It's essentially what is the best way to address and incorporate audience and player feedback in the design process? How do you sift through this? How do you take these people who are willing contributors and how do you involve them? So one of my favorite examples is 
I wrote an article for Polygon a while ago about a Kickstarter uh, called Frontiers. Uh, I was following it up on it not too long ago, and I think it's it's doing pretty well. But their backer tiers had really interesting schemes to them. They made it so if you backed the game at this amount, then obviously we'll give you the game, this, this, and this. But you'll also get access to this toolkit, and you can create plants and you know shrubbery and stuff like that and you can name it and classify it and it's like wow so that's like it's fun for the players and the developers are getting free content and then the next tier was like you can use our other editor to write books that will appear in our in-game libraries so if a player goes there and they look and they see on the shelf this 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 written by you know kickstarter donator 93 you know Mm -hmm. um and so It's this really brilliant fusion between user generated content, agency, and, you know, free labor, essentially. Mm -hmm. So um, then you've got something like esports, right? Esports have become huge. I know Jim has an opinion on esports as (laughs) not being a sport. (laughs) Um, I I just, to be honest, I don't like the term esport. But um, I'm I'm coming around. Oh, I mean, okay. I, I think that it's certainly it's certainly a competition. I would disagree with the label sport, but sure. the label really doesn't it's, matter. It's competitive enough. gaming. It's competitive but, gaming, but, right? But but much how you know your traditional sports will have lots of research and coaches like uh, analyzing previous games and stuff mm-hmm. like that. That has now moved into esports, such as there are several companies now that many people that I've worked with PhDs now work for these metrics companies that analyze esports tactics and gather Mm. data from game logs and then use that and use software like ipad software to deliver that data to esports coaches that then use it to help train their teams and i think um i think games are are getting pretty because of esports are getting to the point where we're going to have and we already sort of are seeing it a split between two types of games um uh, maybe more than two but just kind of go with me here Um, but the idea would be you have these contained experiences that are meant to be essentially the designer's vision of the game. Like Breath of the Wild is a contained experience um, versus something like the new Super Smash Brothers, which we know is coming, or Marvel versus Capcom Infinite that I just talked about, Dragon Ball Fighter Z. Those are esports, you know. So th- those can be those those games can be esports, and I think um, and and to a lesser extent something like a World of Warcraft, where it's a big community game. Those are the sort of games where I feel developers need to be listening to players because these are games that are expected to have longevity, and these are games that are expected to grow and change over time, and these are games that you are expecting the player the player community to rally around, to support, to go to tournaments, to uh, push others to play, to get more sales, generate more sales, versus um, the other element, which is... Um, which is why kind of for me, focus group is a lot of time times a dirty word if you're mm-hmm. trying to or dirty set of words, if you're trying to create essentially art, which I think some games are at least attempting to do that. And if that's your goal and you're trying to create um, a whether it's a narrative experience or a fantastic interactive experience, because I think both are valid in terms of artistically, if you're trying to do that, you may not want the player community to necessarily give you feedback because you're trying to to present um, your vision or your team's vision and not necessarily um, an aggregate of, of multiple opinions. Absolutely. And honestly, that's a really great point and why the field sites that I've got for my study are companies like I've got some folks that worked on Gears of War, which is definitely a contained experience versus I've got some people who work on mobile games or online games. Right. And they're all going to have different things to say. And You know, when I think about the artist statement, right, Uh, or I don't care about what you guys think, this is mine. I think about Ken Levine from um, uh, Bioshock, Bioshock, Yeah, you know, and so the famous story that Bioshock's story came out two months before the game was done, like Ken Levine was just off doing his thing as the creative director, and then he kept telling people, like, Oh, I'll just come back and write it later. Don't worry. And he just churned out the story right then, like the actual narrative and dialogue and stuff like that. And Bioshock Infinite, um, I have very strong opinions about that. (laughs) Yeah, I do too. And not good ones. Yeah, not good ones. Um, But it's his thing. It's his creative vision. It's his story, you know? And honestly, 
in his mind, he's probably like, yeah, I don't care. Like, as long as you buy my games enough such that we can keep making these, that I can keep making my art and producing my stories, I'm happy. Yeah, th- there's a fine balance you have to kind of strike there with kind of like the the artist or the author's vision where um, there's definitely something legitimate to be said for you can't conform your art to just what you think people are going to want. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, you can't have this sort of like arrogant attitude of like, well, the 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 plebeian masses don't understand my artistic vision. Well, know? I mean, you, you're you totally entitled to have that yeah. opinion. Mm-hmm. It's just you're probably not going to be as you, beloved. You need to walk <laughs> that. If, if, if what you're producing is not meant to be essentially an esport or a massive community game, then I think you have to walk that fine line um, between basically between selling out Mm -hmm. and producing a legitimate um, artistic product. And that's not just in games. That's in writing. It's in movie making, like pretty much every medium that you're trying to sort of find that balance between artistry and what's going to be financially viable. And and I think certain certain gaming companies that are releasing games that are a self-contained experience, they're not visionaries. For example, um, I think you look at the, the the essentially yearly releases of, say, Call of Duty or Assassin's, Assassin's Creed. Creed. Yes. Um, these are not – I would not consider those games even attempting to be art. Absolutely they, not. It's, there's no real director's vision. There's no real um, – this is a team that we feel like we have a story that we need to tell. No, it's – what might our community like and what can we sell? It's so funny that you bring up Assassin's Creed because that series is actually what prompted me to ask this question. Really? <laughs> yeah, because um, I loved the original few Assassin's Creeds. Yeah. I, I, I'm with ex- you on that. I accepted that Assassin's Creed 1 was super repetitive and derivative and blah, blah, blah. But I love the concept. Um, and I have tried so many times to make my way through the series and a couple of years ago, I was sitting at a friend's house and I put in Revelations. And the first hour or so of the game is you slowly following some guy across rooftops. It's just so counterintuitive to the game. And then eventually, after you slug through three hours of the game, you get to this point where you have to do a tower defense mini game. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You're on a rooftop wow. and you have to like drag and drop troops and barricades and whatever onto like a, a, a tower defense lane strategy, the exact same thing as you would find in like Dota or something. Um, and I shut the console off. I was so mad because I felt like the developers had no idea what I wanted, you know, and they had no idea what the potential of their game mm-hmm. was. And so I just have to, I'm so curious. I would love to know why they did that. What piece of data or feedback mm-hmm suggested to them that putting a tower defense mini game in Assassin's Creed was a good idea. I, I think with with a series like that that's been around for so long, I think part of that is just them trying to do something different to differentiate the game from the others in the series. Um so really I just think it's them them like, "Oh, hey, what what can we do to make this game this mission different from all the other missions?" which I I understand that, but also I feel that like you're saying, um they're they're going off message, essentially. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think too. The the other thought behind that particular thing was that, um, and there there have been other ways they've implemented this idea. But you are a master assassin, so you're in charge of people, and you're able to sort of like, you know, make these decisions about like, here's how we're going to set up our defenses. And so they wanted you to be able to experience that. In Brotherhood, they added the ability to recruit assassins and to send them on missions and stuff like that, which kind of got the same idea across in mm-hmm. a different way. Um, but yeah, no, I, I think that that's kind of where they were going with it. It's just it wasn't particularly well executed and it wasn't really core to the game. Like I think there was I had to do the tutorial version of that, but then I was stealthy enough the rest of the game that I didn't have to touch but, it. But you know, again. honestly, like that whole concept of being the not just the master assassin, but the leader of assassins and sending them out on missions, mm-hmm. if it wasn't successful then and people didn't like it. Why are we seeing it yet again in Mass Effect Andromeda, where you literally have a table that you walk up to and you send out nameless, well, they have names, but who cares about them, troops, to Whoa, do... hey, that's <laughs> harsh, man. To They're, do missions. They have families, the same right? Position, yeah. That do not affect the narrative whatsoever. Mm. They give you pitiful... Ro- There's no reason mm-hmm. to do it. Why is that in the game? Who finds that entertaining? And why is that something that they, that they developed or um, that they spent developer hours on? Mm-hmm. And, and yeah. yeah, no, no. I mean, you're you're totally right. And I I, I think back to um, 
the, the game developers that I have a lot of respect for, game designers that I have a lot of respect for, are those that I feel um, have a vision for what their game is, and they execute that vision. Um, I'm a big fan of Hideo Kojima and his games, like Metal Gear, the Metal Gear Solid series, most notable. Um, and even though I don't always agree with, with uh, some of his design decisions, when you play a Kojima game, you recognize this is a Kojima game. This oh, is, absolutely. This is his vision, and you you kind of have to respect that, even if you might be critical of some of his choices. And, um, you know, I feel that about uh, the games that uh, Rockstar makes, even though I'm, I'm not going to sit here. I Honestly, I can't rattle off specifically the ones in the company that are coming up with these ideas because I feel like there's there's more of a collaborative environment over in Rockstar is the impression that I get. Right. So it's not just the one visionary, but there are visionaries there's a clear there's a clear direction there. But, you know, I think that's goes, goes back to what Chris was saying about the fact that in any sort of creative industry, there has to be a balance between creative vision and what is financially feasible, whether it's, you know, an artist at the DMA, you know, they can only spend so much on an installation uh, versus how much is that going to pay off in terms of their renown or in games like I have this creative vision that I want to get across, but can I allow these tweaks and modifications such that the 200 people that work for this studio get to pay their rent? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think that's what this overarching question is and this research and just this general sentiment amongst the creative industry as we enter this sort of convergence culture is how do we strike a balance between making what people want, right? Like letting the audience and the players have an influence, have a sense of agency in the development process. But how do we not compromise the creative vision of the game to the extent that you're playing tower defenses in the streets of, you know, ancient London or something like that. And, you know, tower defense is a, you know, an example of something done poorly, but there are also times when the audience legitimately doesn't know that they want the thing that they don't know about yet. Sure. And so like, there's something to be said too, for trying new things, because if you were convinced that it's actually something that the players don't say they want, but you think they would enjoy, you know, sometimes you got to take those risks too. Sure. And no one look at breath of the wild and, and some of the things there. Um, I don't know if there was necessarily people that said to Nintendo, we want the next legend of Zelda to be this fully open experience. Um, I feel like there were, though. I mean, well, Ocarina of Time was pretty lauded for being an open world game. But, it, like, but Ocarina of Time is not really. There, there, right, there of course. There was definitely, but. like, so the sentiment that I sort of picked up from Legend of Zelda is there were a lot of people complaining about it being more and more linear, more and more handholdy, um, being too repetitive, etc. And a lot of people were talking in a vague sort of abstract sense. We want to go back to what the old Zelda was like. And literally the, the original Zelda was some, and that's true. That was mm-hmm. some of the, the, the feedback, some of the feedback that I had, because if you want to look at the, the Zelda that is the closest to an open world model, it's not Ocarina of Time. It is the very first Legend of Zelda. Yeah. Good point. Where you're just going from map tile to map tile. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But you can, you can address Do the dungeons it in any order. In any order. And, yeah. And with something like Ocarina of Time, even though. The world itself might resemble – the presentation might resemble an open world game. When you think about the way that, that you're presented the, and you experience it, it's actually very linear. Sure, yeah, absolutely. You have um, to go from temple to temple to temple, and mm-hmm. you need tools that you get from this temple to then go to that temple. I 100% agree. But I think um, – there is something to be said about presentation, you know, right? Like, course. so I, I always think back to the Final Fantasy games, right? Those are the most linear experiences. But there's something about some of the more successful Final Fantasy games that they make you feel like you're not quite on rails. You can go do a few things. You can mm-hmm. sort, of bask, right. sort of bask in the world that you're in. Um, like Final Fantasy 13. It was just totally open and you felt, yeah, you felt like you did more. Yeah, definitely. Final <laughs> Fantasy 13, the game, the novel, was yeah. was an open world. Yeah. No. I mean, just like the classic JRPG structure of you sort of go from zone to zone, so to speak, and there are side quests that you can do in each place. Um, that's enough to kind of make it feel like it's... Which is essentially <laughs> what we were talking about earlier with something like Dragon Age. Yeah. You know, Dragon Age Origins, you went from zone to zone, and you definitely... It was not an open world, but it was... It gave the sense that you occupied a lived-in world mm-hmm. space, and then mm-hmm. you had side quests to do, you had lore to explore, you had stories to tell. Like, I think the key there is that when you have those side quests, even if it's not a truly open-world game you have a choice as a player as to whether I want to take this on and complete the side quest. And just that choice and the player having the sense they have options, I think is enough to give us the feeling that we are in 
a world that we can explore and we're not just being pulled along through an adventure. Right. And so then it comes down to the question when you talk about something like Mass Effect Andromeda of are those side quests something that's actually going to be worthwhile and rewarding, you know, or are they just there to be extra content to add to people's time played counter? Yeah. And is it what the player wants? Yeah. <laughs> so and, we've been talking, I mean, because with Mass Effect is a good example of that. Um, they, like, like we said, they, they were, they had a lot of negative feedback for the ending of Mass Effect three. Mass Effect Andromeda has had a lot of negative criticism. Um, at E3, they, Bioware just announced their new, um, their new game, their new, like a uh, science fiction RPG, are they going to listen to these complaints and actually address them? Or are they going to kind of bury their head in the sand and say, no, we were right? Um, because I think it's very clear that they were not right yeah. um, as judging by. And I do think that even if you even if Andromeda was their director's vision at some point, they have to also recognize we made a mistake. And that's like Chris was saying, to go back to his point that you don't want to have that arrogance where, um, you know, game designers shouldn't have it and neither neither should filmmakers just because you might have made something good in the past or just because you had a good idea if you didn't execute it well and the community it kind of falls flat Mm -hmm. to the audience then you have to kind of think about okay who am i really making this for am i making it for me to play in a cave and no one else touches it or do i actually want others to have a good experience and if so perhaps i should listen to some extent yeah so you know the the hope is that by listening to players we can avoid things like, I don't remember if it was Assassin's Creed, I think it was Brotherhood or two, when you had to collect all the feathers. You had to collect a hundred feathers. That was two. Yeah. And then it, somehow that magically gave your sister's voice back and you collected a hundred feathers throughout the whole game. They were hidden in obnoxious spaces. There's one line, one line of dialogue as a reward for doing that. And you just have to ask yourself, who thought that was a good idea? It, I think that was kind of like here is a some sort of reward for basically someone who wants to hundred percent. I, th- I think he means the concept itself, not mm-hmm. the reward. Yeah. Um, well, no, I, that's what I'm saying. Like I, the, I think the the pitiful reward right. for it was just a thing they thought they should have to like have something to give the player who really just want to go collect hundred feathers. And also, that's I, I think a big part. Kind of goes back to what we had talked about before, a little full circle. Um, that increases the number of hours that you might spend in that game, and they can put that on a um, you know data sheet marketing sheet and they can sell the game as oh it has this many hours because of bogus quests like that Mm -hmm. absolutely so going back for a second to like how do we look at um the feedback that we get and like how do developers fold that into uh what they're doing and i found an interesting article on a gama sutra um about blizzard and how they use uh what they call a balance triangle to keep overwatch competitive um this was an article by chris kerr So this is something that Jeff Kaplan said, quote, we do what I talk about as a balanced triangle, he explained. So on the one tip of the triangle is statistics. On the other two points are the player sentiment and then our own feeling and intuition. Sometimes all three of those align. You can just see a problem straight up. Sometimes one of those points doesn't align with the others. And there's no right or wrong. There's no formula to it. It's not like if the stats always say they're wrong, they're wrong. It's more art than science at a certain point. It's a system that Blizzard use or that lets Blizzard figure out how to introduce a new character without rocking the boat too much, and in some instances has actually helped the developer realize when a hero needs a complete overhaul. So basically they sort of look at these three things and say, like, if we're making it perfectly mechanically balanced, it might be balanced, but people won't feel balanced. Yeah. And absolutely. so sometimes they'll sort of like let player sentiment or the popularity of characters or lack thereof sort of influence. Like we have nobody playing Sombra because we just released her and nobody knows how to play her. Let's buff her a little bit and have people start playing Sombra more. And then if it becomes overpowered, then we'll nerf it a little bit, bring up somebody else who needs some help, that sort of thing. Um, so I just thought it was an interesting little article about that concept of how do you do this. Oh, they've been doing that for years. They did that with uh, World of Warcraft and constantly readjusting the balance in the classes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's it's that perfect balance of you have to take sentiment along with data. Mm -hmm. And then of course, like Jim was saying to direct our vision, you know, you have intuition, you have these things that you as a designer, as a veteran, as a gamer feel that are right. And you just balance that against the Mm -hmm. other sources of feedback that you have. And it's just sort of the hope that if we do that right, and we propagate that sentiment throughout the industry, then we can avoid collecting a hundred (laughs) feathers. And on that note, I think uh, we're just about out of time. So thank you, Richard, for joining us. It was good to have you back in town. And have yeah, you back glad on to the be cast. here, guys. Yeah, it's a good talk. Congrats on breaking the 100 episode mark. Thank you. 
Uh, and thank you, Backward Compatible listeners, for joining us for episode 104 of the Backward-Compatible.com podcast, our discussion on the ways that audiences influence development. I'm Chris. I'm Jim. And I'm Richard. And we'll see you next time. We want you to write into the show because dialogue makes everyone better. If you want to comment on this episode, ask a question, share some info, voice an opinion, or request a topic, send an email to inbox at backward-compatible.com, and we may feature you on a future episode of the podcast. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible. Backward Compatible. This, this, this is Backtalk, where someone shares new thoughts on a previous discussion.